Welcome to this fifth CPD webinar in our series covering the topics of how to model existing drainage systems and flood mapping with XP Swim. My name is Peter Coombs and today's webinar is focused on the topics of sanitary and combined sewer modeling. I'm really pleased to introduce you to my two colleagues with me today. Uh, they, they will both be part, actively participating in the webinar and that's Samra Mohandes. Um, Samer has recently finished his Master's in Civil Engineering at the University of Greenwich uh, after carrying out his undergraduate degree in Syria uh, and then working in Cairo as a construction site supervisor in between those times. And Ludmilla Fadeva. Ludmilla is a drainage engineer with eight years of both design and modeling experience in the UK as well as overseas and specifically in the Middle East. Now, due to the numbers attending the webinar today, uh, again, we've had to mute everybody, but do um, please feel free to send us any questions in the GoToMeeting message box that you can see uh, on, on your screen. And then what we'll do, we'll endeavor to either ask them during the event live or provide a full written uh, explanation afterwards. So during this webinar, we'll be showing you how to use XP Swim to specifically consider dry weather flow, the wet weather flows, uh, calibrating a model, and then we're going to chain, uh, check a, a range of overflow scenarios that we've set up for you. Uh, Ludmilla and Summer and I will all take it in turns to demonstrate these items live with the software after this introduction. With regard to requirements and, and guidance available, there is a plethora globally. Um, so I'm just kind of focusing on a, a few that we've been using for quite a few years now. And recently, DEFRA in the UK has published a letter urging water and sewage companies to introduce monitoring for the vast majority of their combined sewer overflows by the year 2020. Uh, now, this letter was published under the environmental information regulations that came out in 2004, so a decade ago. And what's happening is that we're getting increased pressure on the combined sewer overflows that we've been installing over many decades. and Remember that the CSOs are there to act as safety valves. Uh, the whole intention is for them to just trip, say no more than three times a year. And the penalties are, are getting increasingly higher, in, and I'm thinking of financial penalties now. If we pollute a water course, there's been a recent example of a company being charged over 500,000 uh, pounds for a point source pollution incident. So. This is no small amount of money that we're talking about. There's a range of useful guidance on modeling. Uh, the SIWEM uh, Urban Drainage Group produced a guidance document. Uh, this is on integrated urban drainage modeling, uh, and that came out in 2009. Uh, prior to that, the Wastewater Planner Users Group, as it was known as, produced a guide in respect to the quality modeling of sewer systems. And this guidance provides a summary of best practice that's been used in the UK, for example. Um, it doesn't replace, but it, it does complement the UPM manual. Uh, this is the Urban Pollution Management Manual series. Uh, and there's a WAPO code of practice for the hydraulic modeling of sewage systems. The UPM guidance is produced by the Foundation for Water Research, and it's now on its third iteration. Uh, the first version addressed the major environmental issues arising from urban drainage and wet weather impacts on water quality. So summer will be covering dry and wet weather flows very shortly. The second version, re released in 1998, was a substantial review of that initial um, version. And then since 1998, there have been significant changes in legislation, uh, for example, for Europe, the Water Framework Directive, which is more focused on uh, water quality aspects and biodiversity and the ecosystems, the revised bathing water um, legislation, and also shellfish uh, directives. So a range of legislation coming through. But on, on top of that, we've had during this time step changes in both computer power as well as major software developments. And this has resulted in improved modeling tools for urban drainage, mixed catchments, raw uh, catchments, such as um, XP Swim that we'll be showing you a little bit later. The environmental issues have been reprioritized with an urgent need to take account of impacts such as climate change, 
as well as plan for adaptation and mitigation measures in the upgrading of urban drainage systems. And this is a global aspect, okay? So this is relevant to us all. And I know we have we have people, um, it's very interesting, we should, we should share the countries actually that, that are plugged into this live webinar right now because it's literally a, across the world. So uh, welcome to you all. With regard to the, the, the requirements and guidance, looking at section two of the latest uh, urban pollution manual, or management manual, UPM3, it presents a range of wet weather related design criteria based on standards to protect beneficial uses of receiving waters. So for example, uh, river aquatic life, bathing waters, shellfish harvesting, as I mentioned earlier with the other legislation, and also general amenity use. We're now uh, really waking up to the fact that we have to engage very closely with communities and provide them not only with safe and clean water, but also better amenity. It's a great thing for health. Now, all of the applications of the UPM procedure must meet the site-specific requirements set up by the appropriate environmental regulatory body. Now, for example, if we look at the UK, um, this would be the Environment Agency in England, Natural Resources in Wales, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency in Scotland, and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, obviously, in, in Northern Ireland. These requirements are set out as policy statements, and they aim to ensure that beneficial uses of receiving waters will not be compromised by wet weather, urban wastewater discharges. And these are discharges, I'm thinking, from biosphere overflows, storm water overflows, storms tanks, storm treatment works, storm treatment plants. Now, this latest version of UPM3 is web-based and contains complementary material provided by organizations such as the Environment Agency and uh, the association that I'm a member of, which is the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Managers. <clears throat> Looking at the um, section two, there's a table, table 2.2, which sets out the DEFRA standards regarding river water quality and implements the requirements of the European Wide Water Framework Directive. So you can now see how we're taking this like European legislation feeding it down through into local legislation and local standards. The water company infrastructure, including CSOs, could have really major effects in this area. And across, across the world, we have standards that are coming out in visionary documents all, all over the world. So, I mean, do feel free to share your standards with us, by the way, folks, and we can show you how we can help you to comply with those using XP Square. So what, what I'll do, I'll take, um, take on a quick trip, um, a trip back in time, really. This is the River Calder catchment. If you look at the map of the UK, you can see there's like a little camera image in the northwest of, of England. Uh, this is the River Calder catchment. There are two River Calders in the UK, and I'm talking about the, the Calder that's in Lancashire. Uh, because I worked uh, on, on this project in uh, 1983 through to 1980. Uh, six time over over like a four or five year period, uh, four year period. So the work that we're about to show you, this isn't new. We were doing this like 28 years ago actually, and uh, this brief case study is based on on the catchment up in Lancashire. So if I zoom in a little bit onto that particular catchment, you can now see in the pink area that is the extent of the river called a catchment, and the source of the river is in the Yorkshire Dales National Park. Um, if you haven't been there, I'd highly recommend. Beautiful limestone country, fantastic for walking, etc. Um, and it's really a beautiful rural environment. So the water comes off of that clean environment and then flows through um, a, a very historical industrial area. Uh, and then it outfalls into the sea. So it kind of travels down from the north south and then across um, to, to the west and outfalls to the sea. Now, the heavily urbanized areas and those historical industrial areas are shown in gray here. And I'm going to focus on the Calder subcatchment in the southeast um, part of this particular image and the area that's specifically to the northeast of the Tender Fernley. So this is the section uh, that I was working on as a resident engineer, uh, putting in some remedial works and trunk sewers uh, back in 
1983-84 time. We had a, a major capital works program that was put in place, so I'll explain to you now. So it's, it's that corner that's shown in the cloud in the southeast sort of side of it. So the case study is concentrating spe specifically on the work carried out between the towns of Nelson uh, down to Burnley. So you can see within this red circle, Nelson's to the north, Briarfield, and then Burnley. And the River Calder itself is the darker blue line. Uh, the lighter blue lines are all the tributaries entering into the river. Um, so from sort of uh, Burnley up towards Nelson is the Pendle Water section. Nelson towards Colne and above is Colne Water. These are the names of the, the tributary rivers. Now, back in 1983, the threat to the River Calder and the tributaries, which is Pendle Water, uh, in regards to Nelson and Bradfield, were from the, the sewage treatment works that were in place. And these were built in Victorian times when the, these towns were built up as industrial towns, mill towns actually, and they had sewage treatment works installed. So we had overflows tripping in to the river from the sewage works. The sewage works ate fall into the river. Okay? And we were getting not just clean water discharging, but often highly polluted water. And I can't tell you what was in the, um, the settlement tanks that we discovered when we decommissioned the works. Um, upstream of, apart, apart from the mill towns, upstream of the works were um, a lot of industries like nickel plating, uh, places with extreme heavy metals, high, high concentrations of heavy metals. So in 1983, the main threat to Pendle Water and upstream of that coal water uh, was water quality from the array of those Victorian sewage works coming from the mill towns such as Nelson, Bradfield, uh, Colne and Barford, etc. Now, um, step forward and looking at what we completed by 1986, uh, we built the first phase of the Pendle uh, Valley Sewer Scheme Phase 1. So that's showing from Nelson heading down to the Burn Burnley Sewage Treatment Plant. So basically what happened was um, the Burnley Sewage Treatment Works was expanded and then the trunk sewer was built from Nelson down through the southwest, down to the Burnley through to the works over many miles. Um, and what we did, we decommissioned and took out of play the sewage treatment plant at Nelson and the sewage treatment plant at Bradfield. So we disconnected. However, we did build a combined sewer overflow at the location of the old Nelson Sewage Treatment Works. We decommissioned the sewage treatment works and we built uh, an industrial site actually on the location of the old Victorian works. So looking at the River Calder, the challenges today um, that, we've, that we've got uh, is this post-industrialized river and the modifications to the physical habitat of it when you're in the urban environment. So the big issue is how do you modify this river in the urban environment where you have retaining walls, you have weirs, culverts. These are the sort of one of the main challenges that we're facing in this particular area today. But also the maintenance of these man-made items, channels, and even the drainage systems and the CSO to manage the risk of flooding in the area. Now the area includes um, protecting major transport links. We have road, we have rail, uh, we've got the Leeds-Liverpool Canal, and uh, there's a restriction that, that, that restricts the development of the in-river and the marginal habitat work that we could potentially carry out in this urban area. So we've basically um, channeled everything through into these man-made uh, flumes, and we've got a problem now in opening them up again. But looking further back up the catchment and looking at where we are today, um, the river uh, Calder is part of the, the Ribble catchment, and there are action plans on a uh, river basin management plan scale. We're now looking uh, under the European legislation at river catchments. So each river catchment has action plans, and those action plans are to deliver the requirements of the Water Framework Directive to get our water up to a good quality uh, by a certain period of time. So if you go onto the website, you can take a look at this and see the action plans that are in place. So looking at this particular action plan, uh, I worked for 
uh, Pendle Borough Council as agents to North the West Water Authority, who are now the United Utilities Water Company uh, in the Calder Catchment. And you can see that the actions that are in place right now to be delivered by March of next year, we're looking at biodiversity, and they're looking at delivering a holistic surf catchment project to improve hydrology, to improve habitat, and habitat connectivity. So you can see where I'm coming from with the earlier photographs in the urban environment. How do we open these up to improve this habitat connectivity and reduce diffuse and point source pollution within calm water? So that's calm up to the Yorkshire border and then downstream of that is Pendle water whilst working closely with the local communities. So here's the action plans. You can go there and see all the work that's going on in that area to this day. We move on and, and step back a little bit to uh, the Nelson location to give you a feel for the scale of this. Uh, this is the, um, off of Google Maps, looking at where the old Nelson sewage treatment works lay. And we then redeveloped the site as the Lomache Industrial Estate. And you can see here I've got a blue line, which is the CSO, the storm uh, water overflow, um, which is out falling into the pendle water. So we built the CSO upstream of that blue line within the industrial, uh, prior to actually building the industrial estate, <coughs> actually. So we demolished the old works and then built that industrial estate, having constructed a, a CSO at the head of that stormwater overflow. And zooming in a little bit, um, if we can just jiggle the mouse over, over this area here, you can see that that is the point of the out for the stormwater outfall out um, is entering just under those trees there. There's like a headwall uh, going into the river. So similar works took place around the catchment, and the consequences are, are seen here. Um, when I looked at Pendle Water, there, there are no action plans per se. There's no risk um, that uh, effectively what we've done by putting in the trunk sewer and taking out the old sewage works in Pendle Water has, has done the job. Looking further back upstream, uh, we've got the uh, aspects of cold water. And here I've highlighted in red where the risks are coming from today. So the pressure in terms of water quality is coming from the, um, the livestock farming in the upper reaches and also diffuse pollution that's attributed to the rainfall runoff in urbanized areas. These are the biggest threats that face cold water. And what we've been trying to do in the earlier seminars uh, is looking at stormwater and the effects and encouraging people to use sustainable drainage systems. This is the reason why. Uh, we're trying to mitigate and take out uh, and avoid the problems of diffuse pollution and point source pollution by taking rainfall out of the system at source. Okay, so the biggest threat to the water quality is may seem to be from this diffuse pollution, either from the rural runoff, farming stock, or the urbanized areas, and I'm thinking there, the hydrocarbon runoff from the highways, um, typically. So we have to map this out, and we have to register where we, where we are. And this is the story today. Um, looking at the Water Framework Directive requirements, we need to get everything up to good standard, which is green. So all of those little subcatchments should all be showing green. Um, the yellow are moderate and the orange are poor. So you can see where the, 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 the action plans for this particular area are still live, they're still going on, and it's within the heavily industrialized areas, the highly urbanized areas, <laughs> that the majority of the action plan work is taking place right now. So this has been going on, to my knowledge, for at least 28 years, and it's an ongoing process, so it doesn't happen overnight. So here's the baseline data that we have to produce to comply with the Water Framework Directive. Uh, as I mentioned, the areas addressed in the upper river catchment 28 years ago have gone from, I know that those river discharges would have been uh, designating poor. So maybe we've at least taken to moderate and good, but, you know, good effort, but still more, more work required. And there are many ongoing schemes with a range of partners, and I'm emphasizing the word partners here, uh, to improve biodiversity, as well as continually improving the water quality, and specifically in the lower river catchment area, which can be seen from this graphic, where the moderate and those poor areas are indicated. So in other words, we're still striving to achieve the, the good status 
but in partnership with a range of stakeholders. And these are local authorities, it's the environment agency, it's um, the community itself, and businesses. Everyone is engaging in this. It's, it's, it's great to see this evolving. So, I think that was a little bit of a long-winded introduction, so I make no apology for that because I think it sets us up nicely to see how we can help you today by modeling today's power and combined service that are seen as those ongoing threats due to point source pollution and subject to the recent DEPRA letter to the, the water companies. Now, Ludmilla and I will cover calibration and overflows, but first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Summer, and uh, Sam, Summer's going to cover how to model the dry and the wet weather flows in a town somewhere, I believe, Sam. <laughs> so, over to you, Summer. Thank you, Peter. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here. I'm going to start with the dry weather flow and the wet weather flow, and that's what I'm going to cover for today. So, if you look at the left image here, we can see that the dry weather flow, which is coming from the building, and then it's going to the treatment ports. This is when we have sun, uh, sunshine. Um, I'm looking at the sewage from the uh, residential and commercial and industrial. But when we have uh, rainfall stones, we have uh, to the top of that, we have some flow coming from the storm drain and flow coming from the roof. So we have more flow, and this is called the wet weather flow. So um, uh, we're going to talk about accounting for this flow in more details. We can have an idea about the dry weather flow using the flow monitoring data. Then we analyze to develop representative week, weekend, and uh, weekdays, dry weather flow, hydrocarbon, and interstate. And of course, we need to assess the growth population and be prepared for changes. Talking about changes, changes, the population in 2050 is expected to be 9 billion and more than 70% of them will be living in big cities, which will create more burden on our sewers. We cannot predict these changes in the model, but we can adapt and respond to them. And when I say adapt, I mean that we should account for any additional flow, and this can be done by, uh, apologies for this long word, parameterization, which means that we are going to break down the flow into building blocks which we can make sense in physical sense of. Now, <clears throat> let's see the dry weather flow dialog. And welcome to Summertown with sunshine and rainbows. And by the way, I'm the mayor of this town. This town. So this is what the dry weather inter interface looks like. So if I go to the hydraulics mode, and I double click on the node, and then if I go to dry weather, This is how dry weather flow interface looks like. And we, you can see here that we can generate dry weather flow for various land uses, uh, residential, commercial, industrial. And we can have direct flow or unit flow rate, which is flow, uh, normalized flow, flow rate times area, or census base, which is normalized flow rate times area times density, and of course times PP factor. And if we go to the temporal variation, here we can break apart any characteristic against the physical characteristic of the system. So let's say we have residential, commercial, industrial, as we saw in the last image. So from, from here, we can insert the diurnal pattern, so we can break those up to have the exact idea of where the flow is coming from during the day, 24 hours, and during the week. So we have weekdays and weekends as well. And we would have for different pattern for the residential. And in one node, for this node, for example, we, we can have a combination of dry weather flow coming from residential units, commercial units, and industrial units as well. So let's say we have some capacity which is taken up by dry weather flow. And we know that we have growth in the future that will take some capacity as well. But the real driver for capacity is the wet weather flow, or in another word, the inflow which is derived from the rainfall. They call it in some countries RDII, which stands for the Rainfall Derived Infiltration, and XP-SWIM is suited to make this estimate. 
So this flow, RDII, represents the increased proportion of water flow in a sanitary sewer system or a power system that occurs during and after rainfall. This is the main cause of sanitary sewer overflows to basements, streets, or nearby receiving waters. An excessive RDII can also cause serious operating problems at wastewater treatment facilities. So how can we estimate the wet weather flow? Well, I can think about five ways to estimate the wet weather flow, and let's start with the simplest one. The first way, which is a simple way, it's called simple peaking factor. So if I know that my wet weather flow is three times my dry weather flow, and I have a steady flow model, we can multiply the dry weather flow by three. So I can go there, my dry weather flow, and I can have a peaking factor of three to represent the wet weather flow. And maybe we can have a peaking factor of six for residential, as example, and a peaking factor of four for industrial. So this is the simplest way. The advantage of this way is that it's easy. However, it's not time dependent. So we cannot have an idea about the volume of the flow and no idea of how this, this flow interacts. So we will not have time to peak understanding. Another way to do that is adding additional patterns. So I can add it to the top of my existing dry, dry weather pattern. So we can have an idea of volume reaction based on time on the system. But we still cannot extrapolate the results. So if I have my, this is my dry weather flow, I can add another pattern and I can represent my wet weather flow in, in a different pattern. Or we can add user inflow in the, in the, if we are in the high risk mode, we can go to user inflow. Let's say that we have our wet weather flow data as a flow uh, time versus flow format. So we can add a hydrograph, which will represent the flow uh, generated from uh, the rainfall during and after the rainfall event. So let's say we have three hours. And for the sake of example, I will say I have um, zero Let's say this hydrograph represents the wet weather flow. If I say okay to that, and now my wet weather flow is considered in this model. Also, we can model the wet weather flow by having a node in the runoff mode. And here we can have a catchment. So if I draw catchment here. And then I can connect this catchment to this node in the runoff mode or in the hydrology mode. And of course, uh, XT Swing will be able to calculate the area of the catchment straight away uh, automatically. Let's say it's 10 hectares. And by inserting the percentage of impervious area and some other parameters like the width, and the slope, and the, the routing method, we can now, and the infiltration data as well, and then we can design rainfall storm or add a historical rainfall storm to be landing on this catchment, and then we have storm water will run off from this catchment to this node, and this will represent the wet weather flow. So I will show you quickly how we can design a rainfall storm. If I go to the global data, if I go to rainfall, I can create storm. And let's say using FSR plus study report. So I will call it 30. And let's say it's 0 0.4. And it's 60 minutes from summer, England, and 30 year return period. So if I say generate, say OK to that, then I can go to the node and I can tell the software, well, I have this storm landing on this catchment. And then the routing method, we have more than 22 routing methods. We're not going to cover this now. Um, we, uh, we have five UK hydrology methods, volume flow, private PR, FSI, PH, PH. So then we will have run <laughs> runoff, we will have infiltration, evaporation if we want, and then we will have the wet weather flow from this catchment to this node. Last but not least, we have the direct inflow or the parameterized approach. 
which has not only time variant, but also it has an impact based on rainfall. This is basically inflow and infiltration, which is derived from the rainfall. So if I click on the node, and then click on subtachment one, if I go to IDII, and from here, I can enter these parameters, which are the width with hydrograph parameters for short term, medium term, and long term. And of course, this is the best method to represent the width weather flow, but obviously we need more data uh, uh, to obtain these parameters. So this is my part for today. Now it's my pleasure to hand you over to Ludmila. Ludmila will talk about calibration and pump flows. Over to you, Ludmila. Thank you, Summer. Now, when we have dry weather flow and wet weather flow inserted into the model uh, in the summer city, we are good to go if this is a proposed network model, like summer city. <laughs> but what should we do if this is an existing system model? Obviously, we need to calibrate it. In order to calibrate the model, I would need flow or level monitoring equipment to be installed in the server system. Uh, so let's see the both options. So, uh, if we have uh, level monitoring equipment, we would calibrate the model through the node, and if we have flow monitoring equipment, we can do it through the link. I have a model in here, which is an existing model of an existing town in US, which is called Denison Town. So, I know that I have some monitoring equipment installed down here. Let me just tick off the background image. Our node 304i has some monitoring, level monitoring inside. So all I do, I double click on the node, I click on the gauge data. Uh, as you can see, the gauge level is ticked, so I have some link there. So if I go inside, and all I need to do is select a file with the data which uh, I want to calibrate with. One second, let me just go to Denison data. So uh, my file is a CSV file, but you have options of that files and text files as well. So I just open a file. Now all I need to do is I need to set up a link. So how the software is going to read this file. So this is a user-defined link I set up. So I have one already set it up, but I would just enter it to show you how it's done. So if I press edit, so I just tick on free format, CSV in my case, and all I need to do is I need to add different parameters I want to read in the same order as they are in the CSV file. So in my CSV file, I have date first, then I have time, then I have flow, then I have elevation, then I have a dummy column, and then I have velocity. So I just enter them all in a way they are set up in, in a CSV file. All I need to do then, I press OK, I press Select, I click OK, I click OK, I click OK. You do not need to rerun the model because all what it does, it brings in the data from the database. So now if I press Review Results, I will be able to see uh, my modeled data and my calibration data. So in this case, you can see that calibration data is gauge depth, which is a dark black line, and my model data is stage, which is a dashed line. So I have modeled only for a few days this particular model. But what we can see from here is that there is a difference. So my gauge depth is different from my model depth. So it indicates to me that there probably is some um, mistake maybe in the model, maybe I, I, I entered wrongly the invert levels, or some other investigation needs to be done to understand why this difference is happening. Though there is a small difference in the level itself, when we can actually see that the pattern is quite right. So the model is getting the actual uh, flow pattern quite good. So now, uh, this was the level, but very often we do not have the level. We, what, all we have is just the flow. So now I'm going to show you how to calibrate according to the flow. So if I open the link up, press on the gauge data, 
gauge flow. Same, same, I select my file. So I go to Denison data. It is exactly the same file I had be before. So I just click, click open. I again need to set up a link. So it is exactly the same link because it is the same file. So I'm not going to go through it again. So I click OK, I click OK, and then I click results, review the results. Uh, let me just improve the view so we can better see the light colors. So now what I have, the cyan color is uh, the gauge flow, and the dark blue is the actual predicted flow. So what we have in here is that we are actually predicting more flow than there is actually measured by the equipment. So either, so this as well can mean a few things. That either uh, there are some properties which are not contributing, but they are actually in the model and we consider them as contributing, uh, or there is uh, some other reasons. So again, you need to investigate why you have a difference. But uh, for this example, this is a very good way how you can see, you can actually compare the actual flow against your model flow. And as obviously, the more calibration equipment you have uh, in the system, the more flow monitoring or level monitoring equipment you have inside the actual sieve, uh, the better your model can be. Because obviously, in this model, I had only one location where it was installed. So I can measure it for this particular place, but I don't know what is happening downstream. Of it. So the, the next thing I would like to focus on is the pump. So obviously nowadays there are there are probably no systems of sanitary sewer or whole uh, sewer where which doesn't have a pump inside. So we can very easily represent a pump flow in XP Swim by converting uh, a simple link into a multi-link. So all we do we right click and we tick multi-link and it becomes a multi-link. So I have one multi-link in here. If I just double click, in a multi-link, we have an option of pump. So in this particular multi-link, I have two pumps. So this means that I have two pumps in a wet pump. I can set up my um, dynamic head, my initial depth, my static head, my pump start, my pump stop level. As well, I can set up a pump flow rate against a dynamic head curve for the pump. So in this particular example, I have two exactly the same pumps. They have exactly the same parameters. So I'm not going to go inside the second one. So what happens if now I will show you the long section of this network? And if we just take here, so you can see this is a, the, the pink line is a hydraulic grade line. So if I click play, you can actually see how the water is pumped up the hill. So all these pipes, uh, they are set up in a way so they are considered to be as a rising main. So the manholes are sealed if you are doing 1D, 2D analysis, so there won't be any water coming out of these manholes because it's, it's a rising main. So, uh, you can actually see, yeah, so the pump is working and how it is working. As well, if we zoom back in into our multi-link, where actually the pump is described, and if we tick on results in here, we can see the pattern. So we can actually zoom in somewhere, and we can actually see how the pump starts and stops, and for how long it works, and how many times a day it starts. As well, if you have uh, some gauge data for the pump, you can do exactly the same as you do with a usual link. You can enter the gauge flows. You just need to have a file. And then you can compare how is your actual pump working against your model. At this point, I am more than happy to hand you over to Peter, who will talk about overflows. Perfect. Thank you, Liz. There's a question that's come in, and it was just a, a, a clarification now. So, in terms of the the gauge flow and the gauge level, yeah, how does how is it different between the nodes and the links again? It was a question that's coming from Mohammed. So, uh, basically, 
uh, the, the flow is the cubic meters you're measuring and the level is, is just the difference of the level. So you can't measure the level in a pipe, you can only measure it in a manhole. So that's why you can only enter the level measuring data in the manhole and you can enter the flow data in the pipe. Perfect, thank you. So I hope that's clear, Mohammed. Have you got the, the fact that if you've got the flow monitoring equipment based on, on flow calculations coming through, you add that to the link, the gauge data to the link. And then if you have a depth gauge, uh, you, you add that to the node. Yes, correct. Right. Thank you, Ludi. Okay. So what I'll do now, I'll, I'll take you from sunny, rainbowy summertown to pluviously precipitating Peatstown. Uh, because I've set up a little model here, and uh, simple model. Uh, basically, everything's flowing from the south up to the north, and we have dry weather flow coming down to the wastewater treatment plant, then to a sewage treatment works here. Um, but also, there are a couple of areas. These uh, uh, grid areas, these, these catchments, subcatchments, are entering into two different nodes. So let me just show you what we've got. Um, we're in hydraulics mode here. So if I click on node number one, that will pop and show us that we have dry weather flow associated. Okay, so there's the dry weather flow coming in from the town upstream. That could be the town of Nelson or whatever that I showed you earlier on. And, uh, and then if I go to the runoff mode, because we've set up some wet weather flow as well, I'll, I'll click on wet uh, runoff mode and then click on node number two, you can now see the subcatchment area that's entering in, delivering that, that wet weather flow as well. So we combine both basically into the same model. Uh, it's flowing down to the wastewater plant. I'll put the hydraulic mode back on again. So it's flowing down towards the wastewater plant. And normal scheme of things, everything's just working nicely. But what's the impact of the rainfall that happens every week when I go to my mailbox and I haven't received any mail or anything, I cry heavily onto these catchments and it generates a lot of runoff uh, and that runoff enters into the system. We've set up two scenarios here. One is base scenario and then the second is based upon a lack of maintenance that could happen to this final link going down to the wastewater plant and that's with a blockage. So if I just click on the top here. You can see the scenario analysis between base scenario where everything's sweet and clean and I have a smiley face, but then you have the impact of non-maintenance with the blockage. Let's look at the base scenario and I'll click uh, on the upstream end here. So node one and holding the shift key down to the wastewater plant. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll take a look at the dynamic long section to show you what's happening for the base scenario. So here you have, I could, I could do the video play, but basically the, the pink line here is showing you the top hydraulic grade line. So we have water filling the pipe and it's flowing down to the wastewater plant. We've run the model for a month. So it's, it's uh, a month's worth of analysis and that's the top hydraulic grade line. And then what I'll do is uh, I'll take a look at the blockage scenario. So what if we change the blockage scenario? And again, I'll select, hold the shift key down, and then select the wastewater treatment plant. Now, if I have a blockage, what's the effect of the blockage uh, by not maintaining that pipe? The dark black area here, in a 600 millimeter diameter pipe, we've got 250 millimeters depth of sediment. So for whatever reason, but you can add in whatever depth you wish. And this is now showing us that the top hydraulic grade line, although we're not flooding, um, the, the top hydraulic grade line has risen up above the pipes, surcharging up in the manholes. And what I've done at the downstream end, I've set up a combined sewer overflow here at this node. So we have a weir, a side weir that then goes out and will trip for extreme rainfall events and discharge off to a water course. So looking back on the plan view, when the water level rises high enough, it will trip over the weir and then the storm water overflow, the storm sewage over, uh, storm water overflow will trip in and then they fall to a river over here. 
so let's have a look at that scenario. So I'll click on back onto the upstream node and I'll click uh, hold the shift key down and then take a look along the stormwater overflow and then take take a view. And so now you can see at the higher level the main the main run is coming down. If I just hit the video play and speed this up a little bit for you. So you have water levels rising, water levels rising falling, and then a few peaks. Now those peaks, that's the kind of weekly rainfall event. When I go to the mailbox, I've got no mail. So you can see there's a particular peak there where the overflows tripped, the water's gone over the weir, and then discharged through the stormwater. Okay, I'm going to take a look at the uh, the difference between the two in a second and show you the results. Now the water levels are rising and falling, rising, falling. So this is the diurnal pattern that, that Samad showed you earlier on. So you have the industrial, you have the residential, you have maybe the commercial diurnal flow patterns. It's the dry weather flow. And then the peak is that weekly rainstorm that happens in peak time. Okay. So if I close on that, and uh, let's take a look at what's happening at the CSO kind of level. So if I click off of here and then back to the CSO, Oops. Okay, and then take a look at the results. Now I find this really interesting because the two different color lines represent the base scenario and the blockage scenario. So the blue line is when you have that reg regular unblocked situation where We've got the water levels rising up to about 6.4, something like that. Uh, this is the diurnal pattern, the odd rainfall event, not a problem when we have the masons on the pipe. What happens if the pipe's partially blocked? 25 centimeters of siltation in the bottom, bottom. This is the impact. Okay. It's showing you the increased spikes. Okay. In, in that, uh, depth of water. Maybe um, for a future webinar, what, what I might just do is replicate, like going back to the CSO that I showed you earlier on. Uh, see if I can talk to some ex-colleagues and what have you, and let's, let's set up that scenario and show you how that's working. And this stormwater overflow should only trip, say, three times a, a year. And that's telling me that uh, for that particular month, uh, I could run a year's worth of rainfall through here, it's, a, it's only going to have a problem if we end up with that means it's not taking place on the downstream pipe. So all range of scenarios can be analyzed there right now. So I hope you really found that interesting. I want to thank Samer. I want to thank Luz Miller for once ago again showing us how versatile and easy it is to use XP Swim to set up your sanitary and combined sewer models with whatever information you have. Um, engage with us, talk to us if you have problems. Let us know, um, and we'll do our best to help you out. And I hope you can appreciate now how we can we can pretty well model everything in one fully integrated project. And when I say everything, I'm thinking from natural water courses through to all of those components of man-made drainage systems, culverts, pipes, channels, pumps, whatever you may have. Please let us know if there's anything that you've got or working with that we, we haven't covered and we can cover it in the future one or address that with the software itself. And that the modeling can be done in a very uh, user-friendly way using that graphical user interface that's uh, giving you the ability to calibrate against those known flows. So as Lude Miller showed you, this is how you can check and calibrate your models and validate them to make sure that you're working um, consistently with a range of rainfall events and scenarios, etc. to make sure that you're capturing everything and, and getting this modeled uh, as accurately as you possibly can. Now, in the next XP Swim webinar on the 21st of January, we'll be covering the very important aspects of water quality that I alluded to earlier on, because the main one of the main drivers coming through is not just the hydraulic uh, analysis. It's what about if we do get a flood? What if it's point source pollution? Uh, what's being carried through these networks right now? And what are the concentrations of these pollutants? We're going to show you how to model that um, come the new year. Um, but after this event, we will, we have made a recording, so we'll upload the video 
as soon as we can get it edited and take out my er, ahs and ums, I uh, will put it onto the website and let you know. Uh, we'll produce a frequently asked uh, question fact sheet and send out a brief survey monkey to obtain your feedback and enable you to um, get a hold of your CPD certificate. Uh, just like to thank Summer and thank Luke Miller for the participation and for all of your uh, questions that are kind of coming in. I can see Luke Miller clicking away and drafting up some responses. So we'll share those with you after the event. And uh, before we go, just like to say, Summer, Luke Miller, and I would all like to, uh, and us all at XP Solutions, would like to wish you all and your families the season's greetings and best wishes for a really healthy and happy 2015. Happy New Year, everyone. See you happy next year. Happy New Year.